Jesus loves church. You know, in these first five chapters of the book of Revelation, here's my opinion. The NIV, Neil's interesting version. This is what I think. I think in the first five chapters, we see Jesus' love, that which is often up for your own interpretation, it seems, in this modern culture. But I believe that we see the love of Jesus revealed in chapters one through five. In Revelation chapter one, verse 19, we're given what many would call a divine outline of the book. A divine outline. Verse 19 of chapter one, John is told this, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the outline of the book of Revelation. And this spring, in chapters one through five, we're learning about Jesus' love for the church revealed. Now, one of the things we've been doing over the last couple of months on a Sunday morning, for those that are interested, or I don't know, have you ever had a problem just staying awake in a sermon? I'm the only one. Um, Sometimes teaching notes are helpful. We're all different. You know, I have six children, and my oldest three children each had a friend spend the night last night. You know how many children that is in the home? With a puppy and a bunny? I need everything I I can get to help me focus. You know what I'm saying? So we provide teaching notes sometimes. Often, if I'm having the opportunity to to share with you on a Sunday morning, if that's something that you go, man, that'd be helpful this morning. The caffeine's not doing it for me. I need something to focus on. You know, there's a website that we'll put up on the screen um, called Coastline Golf Breeze backslash Revelation 2022, I believe it is. And when you go to that link, you'll see these tabs where the notes that I have in front of me for today's date, you can find in front of you. If you're like, that doesn't do it for me, I want another option, I'm a consumer and I want another way to consume God's word, just teasing. Uh, There's print options out in the foyer as well. But if you were to get up right now, it'd be a little awkward, wouldn't it? But anyway. Um, But those are available for you. They're also accompanied by group discussion questions. Many of our small groups, our connect groups, focus their time of grouping together in God's word by just applying that which we're learning on a Sunday morning. I love that, because it's like a a one-two. Does that make sense? Like, man, I'm, I'm hearing it preached, and then I'm learning how to apply it together as a community. So if that's helpful for you, you can check that out. But in this series, in these five chapters... We're seeing the love of Jesus revealed, revealed. That's an important word for the book of Revelation. Revelation simply means unveiling or revealing, to uncover or to make manifest. What does that look like in the 21st century? Well, Layla Patricia Love showed me what it looked like on Friday. Friday was her birthday. So let me show you what it was like in our home early in the morning. Don't judge us in how we look. It was the morning. We're all in our pajamas. But this is what it was like on a Friday morning as Layla Patricia Love opened and it was revealed unto her. A birthday gift. Let's check that out. Scooter. Look at that guy, a little jealous. <laughs> Revealed. That's what it was like for Layla. And there was two different expressions there. Liam, whose scooter was broken at the moment when he saw that his sister got a brand new one. You know, you know that feeling. Anyway, the book of Revelation reveals, reveals. What does it reveal? It reveals to us who Jesus is. That's what the book of Revelation reveals. In chapter one, verse one, this is what it says. This is the revelation, and I love the way the old King Jimmy puts it, of Jesus Christ. What's the book of Revelation all about? Me getting my timeline together and learning how to fight with those that don't don't agree? No. This is a revelation of Jesus, of Jesus. 
which God gave to him to show to his servants and the events that must soon take place. That's what Revelation is about. The book of Revelation reveals to us Jesus and the events that soon must take place. Who is Jesus? You know, I thought about that a lot this week. And many people still see Jesus as that humble servant who was homeless who came to die. And that's who he was. But who is he? Let me share to you who Jesus is now in his glorified state. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. This is what it says of Jesus. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, this is John, he said, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstand was someone like the Son of Man. You remember that phrase that Jesus, the Son, that was a term that he'd often used, descriptive of himself. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. And he held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. That's who Jesus is. Who is he? He's amazing. Like if you bump into him at Walmart, you don't miss him. Did you see that guy with the sash? Did you see that guy with the sword? His voice was like a hurricane. Why is this important? Jesus is no longer the humble, marginalized peasant from Galilee. He was that. He must be that for you and I to have a right relationship with God. But who is he now? Just one of the angels? No. He is the one who has all authority and power. Now, why do I belabor that point? Because the book of Revelation belabors that point. See, here's the thing about the book of Revelation. God has given it to us to prepare us, not to scare us. God has given us the book of Revelation not to conceal things from us, but to reveal the truth to us. The book of Revelation hasn't been given to overstimulate our brains, but to motivate our hearts and our hands to worship. See, in Revelation, we're given a fuller and greater sense, unveiling, revealing the you know, that of the scooter, of Jesus. He is the primary focus of this book. Now, in the last couple of Sundays, excluding the Easter services, we've been considering these seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And Jesus writes these letters by proxy through John to these churches. This morning, we'll be in the sixth letter, the letter to the church of Philadelphia. We'll look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. But one thing we've been learning as we've been walking through these letters that Jesus gave to those whom he loved is that they followed a similar pattern. Now, if you know me, if we've connected one-on-one or in a small group or in a, a gathering like this, you know that I am an addicted alliterator. So here it is. Here's how the the, the layout of the letter looks. There's another alliteration. Here it is. Church, characterization, commendation, critique and complaint, command, counsel, caution, and comfort. Did you get all that? It's in the notes. Jesus comes to each church and through a similar pattern, shares. And today, as we look at the church of Philadelphia... One of the things that he is very intentional about sharing is who he is, his authority, his power, his strength. This morning, we'll consider what Jesus has to say 
to the church in Philadelphia. Look at verse 7. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. In this scripture, we see the church identified that Jesus is speaking to and a characterization of who Jesus is. The church. Philadelphia. Now, this isn't PAUSA. That's not where this is written to. But it's in modern-day Turkey. You may know this. What does Philadelphia mean? The city of brotherly... Yeah, the city of brotherly love. Unless you go to a sporting event there. Then it doesn't mean that anymore. (laughs) But it's named after its founder, Atlas II, who is... He and his brother... They were just good brothers. Man, that's where the city came from, their love and care for one another. And the city was originally founded, I found this fascinating, as a missionary advocacy ambassador post for Greek culture. The reason the city of Philadelphia was there was to propagate something, was to proselytize, was to be an ambassador. Say, what do you mean? Well... An ambassador outpost for Greek culture. They had their merch that they were trying to get out. They had their stickers. They had their language. They had everything. They're trying to get a specific area, the east, connected to, aligned with, assimilated with Greek culture. It was located, this area, in a strategic place on the postal route from Rome to the east. In fact, the city of Philadelphia was often called the gateway to the east. And the city was to be a center for spreading Greek language, culture, all throughout the Asian provinces. And Philadelphia, history tells us, was a beautiful city, but here was the challenge of Philadelphia. They didn't have hurricanes, but they they were on a fault line. And in A.D. 17, a massive earthquake had devastated that region. And many people in that region lived in constant mindfulness of the challenge of this. Do you know what that's like? That's like Bay Street. Do you know what Bay Street is in this area? You're reminded of where you live. Oh, there there could be a storm. You, You ride by different homes. You go, there's a home, there's a driveway. There's a home, there's a driveway. And you remember, oh, the people in Philadelphia, this is the dynamic of their life. It was a beautiful city. The church there was small, but it was undergoing rejection, isolation, and persecution because of who they were in Jesus. That's one of the challenges they had, but they also kind of lived in this constant state of awareness of the aftershock of the earthquake. Why do I share all this? It plays into how Jesus relates to the church. We'll see that near the end of this text, but Jesus gives this characterization of himself. It's the way in which he connects to the church. He says, I'm the one who's holy and true. Why is this significant? Well, first and foremost, this could be translated as a title that was often used for God, the Holy One. You see that in Isaiah and also in Habakkuk. But the word holy there, it means that he is uniquely set apart from everything and everyone else. No one, no thing is comparable to him. He's true, he says. In the original Greek language, there were two words that could have been used to identify truth. And the one that's used there means real, not fake. He's the true one, the genuine one, the one in which no one else could compare to. Jesus is not humble and a marginalized peasant, but he is holy and true. What is this saying? He is God. Jesus over and over and over again 
through his messages and miracles attested to his deity. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that was the public declaration without having to utter a word that he was Messiah and he received worship. If anyone ever comes to you and says, Jesus never claimed to be God, take them to this text. Jesus is the one, it goes on to say, who has the key of David. This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 22. And most of those to whom this letter was originally intended were Jewish. They were familiar with this quote. It was related to a Jewish hero of theirs who was a dependable leader for God's people. And this is what Jesus is saying. I am the one. Eliakim, that guy that you guys would have known from the book of Isaiah, he was just a shadow. He was just a preview. He was just a trailer of a coming attraction. I am the one who has the key of David. What does that mean? Complete control over David's domain. Jerusalem, the city of David, the kingdom of Israel. And he says of himself that Jesus alone can open doors that no one else can and closes doors that no one else can open. Why is this important? Why does this matter? The church in Philadelphia was struggling. Anyone ever been in a place of struggle? Back left is awesome. You guys never struggle. Oh, one person back there. What does he say to those who are struggling? I'm holy, I'm true. I've got the keys. When you're struggling, you need to know. When things are spinning out of control, you need to know that Jesus is in control. He's got the keys of David. He's true. He's holy. Now, hang with me. Before we learn more about how this applies to our own story, I want to continue reading this letter to the church in Philadelphia. In the remainder of this letter, we're going to see that Jesus brings that commendation, that encouragement. He gives instruction, commands. He gives counsel. He gives comfort. But this is the, one of the only churches that he does not bring a critique or a complaint. In verse 8, we see this commendation. He says in verse 8, I know all the things you do. And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength. Yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Here's the encouragement. Here's the truth. Jesus sees everything that you do. My wife and I have been my wife and I this month for 15 years. And when we got married, we got married on Mother's Day weekend. 15 years later, we realized that was not smart. When you have six children and all the things that you want to do, that just doesn't work. And things change in 15 years. Say, what do you mean by that? Love changes throughout 15 years. It grows, it develops, it matures. Part of that maturity is these six humans. And one of the things I see about having a partner in one of the greatest ministries I've ever experienced, marriage and family, is how much goes in to keeping little humans alive. (laughs) And it is one of the most thankless ministry positions anyone could ever have. Sometimes I meet people, maybe not in our local context, on the West Coast or somewhere else, and they'll say, tell me about your life. And I'll say, let me tell you about my wife. Because people go, how do you do the things that you do? (sighs) Have you met Cece? Why do I bring this up? Sometimes you feel alone. Like no one sees. No one cares. Does this matter? Jesus sees everything you do. I'm often reminded, and I know I've shared of this illustration so many times, of Brother Lawrence, the pot washer that brought revival, the monk 
whose position was not preaching, was not leading music, was not writing. It was washing. And yet he did that unto the glory of God and to the good of others in such a way that it infected that local congregation with the joy of Jesus and many upon many were saved and a revival broke out. We learned last week from Pastor Daniel, the struggle is your friend. Struggle is that which helps strengthen you. And whether or not you can articulate this or not, what you want most in life is not money. It's not for the dust to finally settle for, because when it does, you're just trying to kick it back up again because you're bored. What you want most in life is to grow and to matter, to bear fruit. Can't do that without strength. So what does God do in his grace? He gives you the ability to struggle so that in your weakness, you'll find your strength. What do you need to hear when you struggle? Jesus sees. He's with you. And Jesus is the one who opens and closes doors. You know, in Psalm chapter 75, verse 6 and 7, it says this, For exaltation comes from neither the east nor the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. One translation puts it this way, promotion comes from God. Don't work yourself to death so that someone else will see you. The one who gives promotion, he sees. Trust him. Trust him. Work as unto him. Work as unto him. And what is Jesus like? What does he enjoy? What impresses Jesus? You know what he says here about these people? They obeyed my word and they didn't deny me. That has nothing to do with how much education you have, what your cash flow is like. It has to do with your heart. And every single one of you can qualify in this. You can win in what Jesus wants you to win in. They obeyed my word, they didn't deny my name. I like those people. That's what Jesus says. You know, I came across a video from Pastor Greg Laurie that I wanted to share with you that I feel like, I feel like hits this point home. Let's share that video real quick. Now, I've been a Christian for well over 40 years. And after my conversion, I was impressed by certain things that I'm not as impressed by today. Initially, I would say I was very impressed with super gifted people a gifted preacher, a gifted evangelist, and maybe a gifted singer. And though I, I still appreciate those folks today, I'm impressed by other things more. I'm impressed by people that faithfully live as followers of Jesus. I'm impressed by a husband that keeps his vows to his wife all the way to the end. I'm impressed by a wife who stands by her husband through thick and thin. I'm impressed by a Christian who stays with it every day through sunny days and stormy nights. I'm impressed by a believer who weathers the storms and grows stronger in their faith. And that's what following Jesus is all about. It's long obedience in the same direction. That's what it means to be a Christian. Long obedience in the same direction. You just stay with it each and every day. I love that, that it's that simple. To to stick and to stay with Jesus. Listen, there's only two churches that Jesus doesn't have anything that goes, I'm a little upset about this. What does that mean that this church was without sin? You know, there's a lesson in, in what's not said here. That sometimes not every single sin needs to be pointed out about your spouse, about your leadership, about your partners. It wasn't that this church was sinless, no. I think one of the things that should be the tone and tenor of any Christian is grace and mercy. It's not that Jesus looked at this church and goes, oh, they're sinless. No, 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 no. But he looked at this church and they were suffering for him and just hanging in there. And it's like he says, I've got nothing bad to say about you. Just stick and stay with Jesus. It's interesting. The church that just loved people And the church that just stayed faithful in these seven churches, those are the two that Jesus had nothing negative to say about. He had a lot to say negative about the show church. 
that had a big presentation but was hollow. Had a lot to say about the doctrinal church that made sure every T and I was crossed in the doctrine. He had a lot to say about that church. You know what it doesn't have anything to say bad about? These people love people and they're faithful. You can do that. You can love people, you can be faithful. And yet this is what is in great demand. This is what is lacking in most leaders and most Christians. They just love people and they keep showing up. But I wanna share this with you. This is something you can own. You can do this. And the thing that I love about this is this is what Jesus says, I like that. There's genuineness there. There's love there. There's consistency there. And he says, I'll give you doors. Doors of opportunity to serve for evangelism, whatever those doors may be. But walk through the doors that God opens. You guys ever heard of Wendy's, the redhead that sells cheeseburgers? You heard of that place? Years ago, I don't think they do this anymore. And I understand for not doing this, but they had this little marquee sign that said, if you buy X amount of meal deals, I forget how many, like 40 or something, you win a free flight anywhere in the intercontinental United States. I was like, ooh, you can tell by looking at me, I like cheeseburgers, like, but I can't afford 40 something meals. So I went and got one and I noticed that the way by which Wendy's was keeping track of whether or not you got 40 something was by like the UPC code on your cup. And the cups were 99 cents. So I thought, hey, well, could I just buy 40 something cups? I don't need your drinks, I don't need any of your burgers, I need none of your fries, I just want your cups. And they said, I guess so. I said, perfect, I'll take my 49 cups and I'll take my plane tickets anywhere I wanna go. I said, okay. So I was dating Cece at the time. Cece's the girl that I'm married to, 15 years in the married, that thing. And we were dating, I said, Cece, this is an amazing thing. I've got these friends on the West Coast. Their dad is somebody who has these seats at this place called the Anaheim uh, Pond, like this place where they do concerts. At that time, I really loved the band Coldplay. I said, here's the deal. They have box seats for free. Um, the concert is completely free. And all of these friends, guys and girls, the girls are staying in this house, guys are staying in this house. And if you spend 40 something bucks, you get a free ticket. Here's what I think we should do. This is a door of opportunity. It's biblical. Like, let's get the Wendy's cups. Fly to California, go to this fun free concert. We'll stay in separate houses. It'll be fun. We we're dating at the time. That's what's appropriate. And then let's just come right back. And Cece said, well, what if they don't like me? Who, Wendy's? No, no, no. Your friends. I said, who cares? It's a free flight. We're just going to see them for a few minutes. We'll come right back. She goes, well, I don't know. Like, she had all these questions about what we would do when we got there. And I said, listen, I have no idea. I don't know all the things that God has for us, but I know that Wendy's is selling these cups. <laughs> I know that the place is free. Everything is free. I mean, you kept using that buzzword, free, free, free. And she just goes, nah. And I said, we'll see you later. I'm going. <laughs> We're not married. <laughs> I'm going. So I buy the cups. I go. And then I like, this is like old flip phone. I'm taking like a video of it to show it to her. Kind of like to make like the Liam video you saw earlier. <laughs> with the thing. I'm a sinner, but like, and so I sent it to her and she goes, oh, I wish I was there. And I said, Cece, I, I have everything I could do to try and encourage you. And so we have this little thing that now you know about that anytime we have an opportunity, I say, this might be Coldplay. You know what I'm saying? Like you might, you don't maybe not want to miss out on this. And this is the point. This is the illustration. This is why I share this with you. God has doors of opportunity often all around you. It's whether or not you're paying attention that really matters. Charles Spurgeon used to have a, uh, a school whereby which he trained preachers. If you don't know Charles Spurgeon, you can Google him. So he was the Prince of Preachers from the 1800s. And I've read and I'm told that one of his first things he would ever do with aspiring preachers is would put them in a waiting room before they would come into his office. And they would sit there for what felt like forever with no instruction of when he's coming or when things are gonna get started. After some time, he'd bring the students into his office or the study and say, okay, it's time for your first test. I want you to describe for me everything in the room you just waited in. And they said, what? 
So yeah, this is your first test. Learn the art of observation. What color were the drapes? What color was the carpet? How many people were in the room? Was the room cold or hot? Was it clean or dirty? He said, when you come to a text, you need to learn to look at a text through every single angle so that you can serve people most effectively by explaining it. And if you're not one who's paying attention, you're going to miss it. And here's the challenge that I find often in my own life. I won't know about your life. I, again, I don't know everyone in this room. Oftentimes I can miss what God's doing all around me because I feel like, oh, no one sees what I'm doing. When's the promotion going to come? Or whatever. Instead of just paying attention, God, what have you put around me? And how can I bring you glory and good to somebody else? That's my job today. God's opening up doors of opportunity for you all around to serve him, to share with people the good news. Don't cold play them. Does that make sense? Like, buy the Wendy's cups. Go for it. Like, go for it. Life is so brief. You're only going to get one May 1st, 2022. You get one shot. The morning is almost over. And you're thinking, thank God, this guy. The afternoon's coming for you, the evening, and then it'll be done. Man, live it. Live it well. Live it wisely, but live it well. Live it for that which matters. And the line of service that I give my life to, we see the highs and the lows. We see births and celebrations, and we see cancer and we see death all the time. And part of this perspective gives me a sense of the brevity of life. And I just don't want you to miss it. Don't miss it. He, he gives in verse 9 some counsel. He says, look. This is intense. He says, look. I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue. Can you imagine showing up to that church for the first time? This is Satan's synagogue. That wasn't how they identified themselves, but it was how he identified them. Those liars who say they're Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet, they will acknowledge that you are the ones I love because you have obeyed my command to persevere. I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. What's the point of this? What is he saying? It's reckoning. Reckoning. We will see this in the fall. That God's not like anti-consequence. God's not anti-judgment. That's why we have the cross. Because God in his righteousness judged our sin on the cross. Amen. And for those that don't want that, then judgment must be upon them. But Jesus is saying this, there'll be a reckoning. He says, at this time, see, at the, during this time and culture, the Jews and the Jewish Christian believers, synagogue was like the center of social and economic life. And Christians were being shunned, put out from the synagogue because of their faith in Jesus. That meant they were isolated, disgraced, embarrassed, shunned, missed out on vocational opportunities, missed out on jobs. Their income was going down. Educational opportunities were being taken away from them. And what does Jesus say? You know that synagogue of Satan? You know those liars? They will bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you're the ones that I love. And I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come. I don't know what all that means. But I do know enough to say this. Jesus says, one day I am going to right every wrong. And truth will be heard. I'm thankful for that. Because we live in a world where everyone shows you what they want you to see. And that's not a bad thing. Like when you invite guests to your home, you want to clean up, right? I want to show you what I want you to see. Nothing wrong with that. But if it's disingenuine, if it lacks authenticity, that's the world we live in. There will be a reckoning. Now, I wanted to share with you what Warren Wearsby says about this, because I think he, he gets into a dynamic, a layer of this text that we don't have time to get into this morning, but we will get into later in the fall. But I love how Warren shares this about this time that's going to come upon the whole world. We'll put it up for you on the screen. He says this, he would keep them from tribulation, Revelation 3.10, 
This is surely a reference to the time of tribulation that John describes in chapter 6 through 19, that time of Jacob's trouble. This is not speaking about some local trial because it involves them that dwell on the earth. And he gives some cross references there. The immediate reference would be to the official Roman persecutions that would come. But the ultimate reference is to the tribulation that will encompass the earth before Jesus Christ to returns to establish his kingdom. In many Bible scholars' understanding, Revelation 3.10 is a promise that the church will not go through the tribulation, but will be taken to heaven before it begins. You know what I love about this? Jesus says, listen, you're mine. I've got you. I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to right every wrong. I love that. I love that that's the Jesus we serve. The one who is holy and true and has the keys, he says, I've got you. I've got you. Just keep moving forward. See, for those that are struggling, what they need to hear most is that Jesus is with you. He sees you. He's on your side. And one day, every wrong will be made right. So he gives a command in verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Hold on. When he speaks about someone taking a crown, this isn't like a thief coming in the middle of the night and stealing your birthright or something. But it's basically saying, you don't want to miss out on what God has for you because you give up or you give in. One author wrote this, never forget that the man most likely to steal your crown is yourself. Keep your heart with all diligence, the proverb says, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. The author wrote this, you are in no greater danger from anyone or anything than from yourself. I, I remember that thing that my dad has often shared. You know, my dad's been serving, specifically in this community, for almost 40 years and when you get a guy like that who's that faithful and that consistent, oftentimes people want to go, well, how do you do that? Or ask questions about the ministry. And uh, I remember one time he was asked, you know, John, what's been one of your greatest challenges in ministry? He goes, oh, that's easy. Me. That's been one of the greatest challenges. Me being one who's still going through the process of sanctification while leading others in their own walk with the Lord. Why do I share that? Because this is what Jesus is saying and sharing. Guys, I want you to hang in there. And I want you to do it alone. I don't want you to lean on anybody. I don't want you to go to church. I don't want you to get into a small group. I don't want you to have any support. No. See, I'm going to put this, um, this image up on the screen. You've, you've seen me share this many times. In fact, I shared this on my first Sunday as your lead pastor back in September of 2020. When I kind of shared, hey, this is what I feel God's leading us to do for however long the Lord has me in this position to just serve this church in this way. In this little pamphlet, we share what's our vision as a church? What do we feel like God's called us to do? Us. And if I were to boil it down very simply, I do believe we're here to see new life in Jesus. And then as a church, we're, the, we're to gather together. You're doing that right now. To love and worship God. We're to group together, to build community, connection, koinonia, fellowship. And as we go, we're to live to make money, right? No, 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 no. Go to live on mission. <coughs> now, you got to make money. I get that. But that's not the driver. The driver is to make disciples. Why do I share this? No one ever gets healthy alone. No one ever is always like, I'm doing it, I've got it, I'm motivated, I'm, I'm, I'm focused. We need people in our lives. Personally, I need to be in a small group. So last week, I think I was in four of them. Two men's groups, one co-ed group, and then one online group. Why? Because I'm just bored, there's nothing going on at home. No. <laughs> <laughs> Because I recognize, hey, I need to be connected. It's very easy for a pastor to become isolated. So I've got to be that much more intentional about connecting, about having relationship. Why do I share this? 
Jesus says, hold on to what you have. Hang in there. You don't want to miss the opportunity. What does that mean, that you'll lose eternal life? No, 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 no. It's a free gift. But if you studied the New Testament any length, you know that there's these rewards that Jesus is going to give, these crowns. And then we also know that we're going to lay them down at his feet. So how does that work? I don't know. But I know there's this dynamic, this encouragement, this exhortation from the New Testament to run your race well. That does not mean a sprint for 70 years. It means recognizing that life is short, but it's also long. And that there's pace to your walk with the Lord. There's progress. And that you need fellowship. You are not designed to do life alone, but to do it in community. And then the comfort we see from verses 12 and 13 Jesus says, all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. They will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. And then Jesus closes this little letter with the same caveat he always does. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Jesus says, all who are victorious, and he says four things about those who just stick and stay with Jesus, they will become pillars. Anyone ever heard of David Guzik? Man, I love David Guzik, wonderful guy. I'm so excited that he's going to be with us in September for an Enduring Word weekend where he's going to give an overview of end times theology. It's going to be a wonderful time. But he says this about this text. He says, the ancient city of Philadelphia suffered from frequent earthquakes. We learned that together when we opened up our time together this morning. And he shares, when a building collapsed in an earthquake, often all that remained standing were the pillars. Jesus offers this same strength to remain standing in him when everything around us crumbles. The pillars hold up the building. The only thing supporting the pillar is the foundation. And I like what he says here. True pillars in the church support the church, and they look to Jesus as their support foundation. I love what Jesus is saying here. Those that were in Philadelphia that would have seen pillars still standing from broken down buildings, Jesus said, I'm going to make you a pillar. The ability for Jesus to connect with people is astounding to me. He says, they will never have to leave. Because of the tremors of the earthquakes, the excommunication from the Jews, these Jewish believers undoubtedly felt unsettled and probably somewhat insecure. You know, I've shared with you that I have a number of children. When we moved from Destin to Gulf Breeze a few years ago, we moved three times inside the space of 10 months. And at that time, we only had five children. But that was still a challenge, you know, three moves, 10 months. And I remember in the home that we're currently in, we were in it for about, I don't know, two or three months. And my two young, my boys, they're my younger ones at the time. They said, Dad, when are we leaving this place? <laughs> and I, I said, what do you mean, boys? So well, when are we moving again? They had gotten so used to moving, like every few months, that they thought, this is just how you live. You live unsettled. Like you just live like a vagabond. And like for these Jewish believers, that's how they felt. Nobody wants us. We're unsettled. We don't don't have a home. So what does Jesus say? In my house, you're never going to have to leave. That's just what they needed to hear. He also says that they will become citizens of the city of my God. Your home is permanent. See, in that culture, especially in the synagogue, there would be like a roll call, a ledger. And undoubtedly, their names had been crossed out because of who they were in Jesus. And Jesus tells them, now you're a citizen in my kingdom. And lastly, he says, they will have his name written upon him. At that time, the pillars would have names of those that were important in the city written upon the pillars. And Jesus, just using imagery that they would have been so familiar with, says, I've got my name stamped on you because you're my pillar. What's it take to be a pillar? Well, do you have the doctorate in ministry? Have you served your 80 hours this week for Jesus? No. You know what it is to be a pillar? I'm just sticking and staying with Jesus. 
Staying faithful to him. Loving him. Loving his people. As we close this morning, we're reminded that the book of Revelation is an unveiling, a revealing. And what does this show us this morning about the love that Jesus has for his church? It's not fickle, it's faithful. Jesus is steadfast in his commitment to you. And I think if you want to do well in the eyes of Jesus, if you're getting a a letter from Jesus, what's he looking for? Just be with him. You've heard me say this so many times, but stop trying to be like Jesus and just start liking Jesus and then you will become more like Jesus. This is about a relationship with God. It's not about your production. It's about your presence with him, about being with him in everything that you do. It's not hitting pause on life and saying, well, I must just need to live on the beach with my Bible, and it's just me and Jesus every day. No. It's learning how to be with Jesus in the midst of that work environment. I can't say to my wife of 15 years with six kids, well, Jesus just wants me to be with him today, so... No. He wants me to be with them while we're changing those diapers, while we're taking out the trash. Now, don't get me wrong, there has to be rest, but I think you hear what I'm saying. It's not an escapism. It's missional living. It's living right where you are with a missions mindset to live for the glory of God and the good of others, to see disciples made one step at a time. And that's the church that Jesus says, I don't have anything negative to say about you guys. You're sticking and staying with me. This week, just stick and stay with Jesus. Wouldn't it be awesome if there was a church that daily was helping you get in God's word so you could do that? I'd encourage you, daily get into God's word. If you don't like us and you don't like the videos or the reading plan, that's okay. But just get into God's word. Let that be a source of nourishment and alignment for your soul. And pay attention to what's around you, who's around you. Don't cold play opportunities, if that makes any sense. Don't miss it. You get one shot at this thing called life. Live it well by living for God and living for other people. It's the best way to live.